Ms. Austin. Good morning, and may it please the court. Rita Bettis Austin on behalf of petitioner Julio Bonilla. I'm joined at council's table today by my colleague Gordon Allen. Mr. Bonilla is 33 years old, and he has been incarcerated for nearly half of his life. He was resentenced in 2011 as a non-homicide juvenile offender to life with parole under the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Graham and this court's decision in Bonilla 1. In Louisel, this court decided it need not reach the question which is now squarely before this court, which is whether Iowa Board of Parole procedures afford juvenile offenders like Mr. Bonilla with a realistic and meaningful opportunity to demonstrate his rehabilitation and maturity for release. This requires more than a paper file review where a board of parole member reads a rote recitation of the constitutional case law finding that juveniles and adults are constitutionally distinct. Bonilla has never been provided with a realistic and meaningful opportunity for release. His parole reviews have not met even basic elements of due process. He has never been provided even with an opportunity to be heard. His parole reviews have been paper file only. He has never had any individualized assessment informed by a qualified expert of how the mitigating factors of youth reduce his culpability in terms of the underlying offense or his development and maturity since. And he has never had the assistance of counsel in helping him gather and marshal the evidence of his rehabilitation and maturity. Let me ask you this question. Why, um, he, he is eligible for parole. Why can't he just be treated like any other uh, uh, parolee? I mean, the, the parole board has its rules and has its systems and has some guidelines and does its work. And uh, uh, your client is now in the, in the general group of people that are considered for parole. What, why, why should he be treated differently than anyone else? The mere possibility of parole is not the constitutional requirement to ensure that he is not sentenced to a categorically disproportionate sentence of life without parole. Uh, the requirement is that he be sentenced to uh, life with parole with a realistic and meaningful opportunity for release based on demonstrated rehabilitation and parole. Um, in fact, excuse me, you say realistic. Um, he was charged and convicted with a Class A felony, correct? Correct. And how? I know you said half his life, but he did this when he was 16. How old is he now? He's 33 years old. Okay. Right? So he has served about 16 years, 17 years? Correct. On a Class A. Correct. Is it reasonable for someone charged with that high of a crime to have already been released on parole this early when you compare him to other parolees? Is that reasonable? Do you think it's unreasonable that he's still in there? So the constitutional standard is that uh, we understand that juveniles have reduced culpability. I understand that, and, and I appreciate that. But my question to you is, we're not going to look at that in a vacuum. My goodness, we're talking about a Class A. That's correct. And so what the Board of Parole is required to do as a categorical matter, because he's a non-homicide offender, is to provide him with a realistic and meaningful opportunity for release. And that has to take into account his reduced culpability as an offender and afford him the opportunity to demonstrate his, real, uh, his rehabilitation and uh, maturity in light of the recognition that juveniles have a greater capacity for change and have reduced culpability. What is, what is the evidence that the prison even gave this kid services? I call him a kid, he's 33, but gave this kid services um, that he would be able to demonstrate that he has been re rehabilitated and matured. I mean, is that the problem or is it the, a parole board problem? There are two problems. So uh, Mr. Bonilla is in a catch-22 in that he is um, not made uh, eligible for some types of programming. Um, at two important examples are sex offender treatment program because he doesn't have a release date. Um, and uh, another example is this Grinnell College um, 
program that he applied to, submitted an essay for, um, had an interview for, was admitted to, and then was told, despite all of that, that he would be ineligible to take part because he's serving a life sentence, regardless of the fact that he's a juvenile. So the punishment that he is experiencing in the parole uh, review process that he is experiencing is no different than if he were an adult offender. And that is the type of grossly disproportionate sentence that Iowa's Article 1, Section 17 and the Eighth Amendment what, don't permit. What, what, what if Mr. Bonilla had filed a motion requesting a voc rehab expert to uh, provide evidence regarding his ability to work um, uh, outside the custodial setting, uh, would that be required uh, under the theory you're advancing today? And if not, why not? And what is the limiting principle, in your view, that distinguishes best practices from due process or meaningful opportunity for release? So I'll try to answer all of those, and yep. you can jump in and remind me if I've forgotten a piece of it. Um, so the reason that due process attaches is because juvenile offenders like Bonilla have a categorical right not to have a life without parole sentence. And so the question is not whether due process adheres, but what process is due in light of the fact that he's a juvenile, that he has this greater... Right. So what distinguishes whatever requests might be made in the future from the nine specific things you've identified here? So under the due process analysis, there is flexibility for this court to determine what are the minimal aspects of due process that have to attach in order to protect this liberty interest that he has. And so we have teed up what the state acknowledges are best practices, and we've asked this court to provide those, and those reflect the best thinking of scholarship. So how do I decide account. the voc rehab question? What is the limiting principle that for every single motion or service that might be requested in the future, how do we as a court distinguish between those that are best practices and those that are constitutionally required? The court takes a look at the due process uh, test laid out in Matthews in light of the significant liberty interest that is at stake for juveniles, the right and for Bonilla and for all juveniles in Iowa, the right not to serve life without parole sentences, and it determines what due process is necessary. That's a flexible standard. So, for example, we have asked for um, uh, the appointment of an independent expert, something that this court has held that juvenile offenders well, have let, a, a right to. Let's talk about the voc rehab request. Would he be entitled okay. to a voc rehab expert? So um, your question, I think, goes to uh, two things. One is whether that would happen through the Board of Parole uh, process or the, his right to have the expert, um, uh, the voc rehab provided through the prison. But certainly there should be, um, as part of due process, the ability for counsel to uh, request uh, funds for experts, including a voc rehab expert, if appropriate, if that's something that this court deems is required in order to protect the liberty interests at stake. But so the, the question board would is have not some discretion. I take it. I mean, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. The board wouldn't be required to appoint an expert in every case. I take it is. That's correct, Your Honor. That's correct. And Due process is flexible in this context, and that's something that all of the case law looking at, um, even the question of when due process does apply to adults in the Greenholds case, for example, there's flexibility in determining what processes do. Let me ask you this question uh, hypothetically. Supposing, supposing you had a full-blown hearing and everyone agreed that this 33-year-old prisoner, had a remarkable uh, prison time, no disciplinary anything. Um, everybody said, demonstrates maturity and rehabilitation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, undisputed. But the uh, parole board says, if we look at the nature of the crime, uh, we're just not going to let him out. Would that be constitutional in your view? 
that would not be constitutional because the parole board would be giving undue weight to the circumstances of the offense without consideration of the mitigating factors of youth or the youth's, uh, the juvenile offenders' subsequent rehabilitation and maturation. And that's something that is required for them to have a realistic and meaningful opportunity for release, which is a categorical substantive right, both under the Eighth Amendment for non-homicide offenders and under Article I, Section 17. Um, but if I may, just return to the question, Justice Apple, that you asked at the outset, which is, um, why does a juvenile offender deserve something more than an adult offender? And the answer to that is actually fairly straightforward. You can see it even in the Graham case. Um, uh, you know, a, a number of folks, when they look at the Graham case, they forget that Florida had suspended its parole program altogether. So when the Supreme Court decided that Graham as a non-homicide offender had this right to a realistic and meaningful opportunity In, for in Montgomery, release, the Supreme Court seems to indicate that um, it would be constitutionally sufficient if a juvenile offender was parole eligible after 25 years and they cite a Wyoming statute uh, that provides for the first opportunity for parole eligibility to be after 25 years. Uh, is my reading of Montgomery right? And if so, although I understand that, that you're not satisfied with the process here, isn't the fact that he's immediately parole eligible and at least being considered more than what the Supreme Court seems to have approved in Montgomery. So Montgomery is um, finding that Miller, in the case of homicide offenders, is a substantive rule and that it has retroactive application. And it's leaving to the states, in the case of the Eighth Amendment and for homicide offenders, um, flexibility in implementing this requirement either to have an individualized assessment on the front end or to have this reasonable and, and uh, meaningful opportunity for release if an offender is made eligible for parole. Of course, under Article I, Section 17, this court has found that the Iowa uh, Constitution is more protective and all juvenile offenders have a categorical right not to be subjected to a life without parole sentence and to have this realistic and meaningful opportunity. I, I mean, this is a facial challenge. You're not claiming that your client's entitled to be released from prison at the present time. You're just saying facially the Iowa parole process is unconstitutional as applied to juveniles who are, have life without parole sentences. Why shouldn't we take into account that of the 40 or so who've been, who were, who are covered by that ruling, 10 of them have already been approximately been released on parole. Doesn't that tend to undermine your facial challenge that it doesn't provide a realistic and meaningful opportunity? Right, and I, I'm glad you raised the point. So there's sort of a, a lexicon issue, which is we've brought the claim through 17A, which allows us to challenge agency action as unconstitutional on its face or as applied. But of course, under the Eighth Amendment in Article 1, Section 17, the way that we think about that is a categorical challenge, not a facial challenge. We are, as you've said, challenge categorically the system of parole for all juveniles serving life with parole sentences. And that's something that Julio Bonilla certainly has standing to challenge. Am now, I correct? as to the question... I was just going to, to answer Go ahead, the question I thought you were the numbers. Uh, so um, if you look at the numbers that the state cites, that 10 of these 40 juveniles who are eligible for parole currently have been released, they actually show the importance of these due process protections that we're seeking. So two of those individuals of the 10 were released to hospice and died shortly thereafter. This court has already recognized that the prospect of geriatric release does not afford a realistic and meaningful opportunity. So if you look at the remaining eight, of the six juveniles that had counsel, Assuming Bonilla had counsel, which he didn't, we represented him in seeking counsel, not on the merits of his parole, but even assuming that he did, 60% of juveniles with counsel were able to successfully demonstrate their rehabilitation and maturity and obtain release. Of those 34 offenders without counsel, four were able to successfully demonstrate and their maturity and rehabilitation. That means having the assistance of counsel, that's 12%. So that means having the assistance of counsel made you five-fold more likely to be able to successfully the correlation, not causation, right? We'd have to investigate a little more, right? 
So maybe it, it the is... council got involved in the cases that had the greater potential for release. We don't know, right? So the due process analysis under Matthews makes clear that what process is due as a minimal prospect takes into account not only the particular case in front of you, but what is most likely given the liberty interests at stake in the players. So for example, in Matthews, someone who um, is facing uh, the prospect of living, losing their welfare benefits has a different liberty interest and different prospect is, uh, uh, protections are due than for someone who is facing um, the loss of social security benefits. Here, as the amici make clear, as we make clear in our briefing, and as this court has recognized, there are certain conditions that are attendant to um, juvenile offenders that require additional protections. They have a massive amount of information to gather and marshal. They should be able to exclude information that uh, isn't verifiable and isn't reliable because it's unrealistic to expect a juvenile offender to successfully be able to navigate the parole process on their own. I'm going to pay for this, but I'm going to ask a question. No, I'm going to pay for it because I took up your time. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I am a, you don't have to persuade me about juveniles and how they should be treated differently. And I, and I do think as, as much um, to do as there was about the um, individualized sentencing for juveniles, it was the right thing to do. I was a juvenile judge at that time. I've done many of them. Your guy got that. Um, in a sense, by having the uh, parole hearing changed eventually. But right now, it seems to me the argument you're making is you want that change in our law to carry on over, even beyond youth, um, once he's in prison and up for parole. You appear to be arguing for an individualized uh, assessment similar and akin to that individualized um, uh, sentencing. And my concern is not everybody, but most everybody in prison is bucking for that. They all want to prove that they have been rehabilitated. Why, just because the crime was committed as a child um, and, and they have gone through that process, why should they, after they have achieved maturity, um, age-wise, whether or not you think the brain has matured or not is another day, but they get to that point where they're like everyone else in there, and you're asking this court to treat them very different from everyone else when all of them, I would place a big bet on the fact most everyone in prison has had a horrific childhood, horrific most likely. So they all have those kinds of demons that they're dealing with. So why should it continue to carry on just because the crime was committed um, as a youth all the way through adulthood? Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I see that I am over time. I am so glad that you asked this question, Justice Christensen, because it gives me the opportunity to um, make the sure that the court is aware of the fact that because um, Mr. Bonilla was resentenced to life with parole following the Graham decision. He has never had an individualized assessment. That has never been part of his sentencing, and that's something that the Griman case recognized. But he has that. annual parole reviews, right? He has annual parole reviews that do not provide him a realistic. No, I understand, but he does get annual parole reviews, which prior to that case he was not going to even be considered. Is that correct? That's correct, but that's not the constitutional standard. The standard is that they provide him with a realistic and meaningful opportunity for release. And as Judge Pratt found in the Griman case when he looked at this, which is the same thing that the New York Appellate Court found in the Hawkins case when they looked at this, and the same thing that the Dianchenko case in Massachusetts found in, um, under both the Eighth Amendment and the Massachusetts Constitution, um, this opportunity, when you look at Iowa's indeterminate sentencing scheme, this right to have an individualized assessment which is a substantive right that he has categorically as a non-homicide juvenile offender in Iowa, it will not be provided but for the Board of Parole. And that's true not only for non-homicide offenders um, in Iowa, but also following suite, that is true for homicide offenders. There will be no individualized assessment that takes into account the diminished culpability that juvenile offenders have for their crime unless the Board of Parole meets its obligation to provide a realistic and meaningful opportunity. Thank you. Ms. Austin, thank you as well. Mr. Lundquist. See if I can see without the glasses here. <laughs> Still trying to get used to that. May it please the court, Mr. Chief Justice, fellow justices, Ms. Austin, Mr. Garden. As of today, 
as uh, Justice Manfield indicated, 11 of 43 parole eligible juveniles sentenced to class A felonies in Iowa have been released on parole. That doesn't sound like very much after 10 years. Graham was 10 years ago, and we still have 30 that are, that are still incarcerated. I mean, I well, considering that half of those persons weren't even uh, resentenced to life with the possibility until 2015 or later, I don't think that's necessarily outrageous. As, as indicated in my briefing, Justice Apple, that uh, there was some degree of transition that was necessary Ten because years. these individuals weren't uh, being prepared for life outside prison because that wasn't a possibility that was available to them. And so once the Department of Corrections uh, started providing programming that would assist them in preparing them to step down their security level and provide the skills necessary to exist outside the walls, that the people started moving. So I take it you do, you, let's look for a little agreement here. I think there's some, um, uh, but maybe not. But, 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 but you agree that, that uh, the state has an obligation to provide um, juvenile offenders who are, who are convicted of, of, of crimes as juvenile with a realistic opportunity to show maturation uh, and rehabilitation. I, I'm parroting Miller and Graham and Montgomery and even Roper, I think. You know, I believe that this court has, has made clear through the dicta in its various cases well, dealing with sentencing. Well, the Supreme Court has made <laughs> rather clear. I that uh, that uh, persons, at least persons convicted of non-homicide offenses, have to have that meaningful opportunity uh, for release based upon demonstrated maturity and, and rehabilitation. We can't take it away. It's not like parole. Parole, we could, you know, parole is a matter of legislative grace, and you could, you could, you, know, you could repeal parole statutes and under, I think, United States Supreme Court case law, that would be fine. But we cannot do that here because of the constitutional dictates of, of Miller. We have Carroll. to have a mechanism by which they can demonstrate their rehabilitation and potentially achieve. They have to have that opportunity uh, the to The issue in, the, in those hearings, I take it, is dem the, the, it, it may be magic words, but I'll repeat it again. Um, uh, demonstrated uh, uh, maturation and rehabilitation, I take it, right? The, those, are, those are the words that get repeated over and over and over again, and, and that's what uh, this court and other courts have had to struggle with as to what that, uh, what that means. And, and, can, and then let me follow up with the same question I think I asked the proposing counsel, and that is if, this hypothetical, of course, uh, but if someone had a stellar prison jacket and all this, and everybody looked around and, and and said, my heavens, um, look at this demonstrated maturation and rehabilitation. Um, but, but we don't want to release because of um, the nature of the crime. C could the parole board do that? I believe that um, this court's uh, dictates in the Zerati case are instructive in that situation. I, uh, that that uh, I don't believe that there is a heightened expectation of parole release. However, the parole board cannot, in its analysis, allow what they would characterize as the aggravating circumstances like the nature of their crime and the facts and circumstances there overwhelm uh, evidence of, of true rehabilitation and, and maturity. So I'm going to come back at you, if you don't mind, because I think, I mean, if, if, there, if there was agreement around the horn that this individual demonstrated maturity and rehabilitation. As a matter of law, doesn't that require release? I would would argue that the board would, or not would, I, I, I would agree that I believe the board would be abusing its discretion in that circumstance if it allowed those factors in the juvenile sentencing world to overwhelm uh, the factors of rehabilitation and, and, uh, and uh, maturity. But that doesn't mean that Iowa's current parole scheme is constitutionally or facially unconstitutional because the factors that the board is required to weigh encompass those things that uh, the court has dictated we should be looking at to, to measure whether or not someone is capable of living outside the walls. I want to talk about that, that very issue. You, you say that there are measures that the Department of Correction uses one that gets brought up a lot, and I and I believe they brought it up in their brief. Um, they called it the catch twenty two, and it's a very common problem at at all levels, juveniles as well as adult criminal offenders, 
you can't get considered for parole until you've taken the sex offender treatment program. Can't take the sex offender treatment program until they think you're ready for parole. That's that in and of itself, all by itself, and I imagine many of the crimes we're talking about have some component where they're required to take that program. Can you help me understand that better? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bonilla obviously is, is serving a life sentence uh, as a result of first-degree kidnapping, which did involve uh, sexual abuse. And so, therefore, the board has identified as one uh, advisable intervention that he go through sex offender treatment. The same was true of Blair Griman. Uh, the Griman case that, that's been cited multiple times that uh, was resolved or, or, or addresses a motion to dismiss, as the district court pointed out procedurally where that case was, uh, made that same argument that he couldn't get into SOTP until he had a discharge date. He's never going to discharge, so I'm never going to get out. Right, well, is that argument false? Well, the department put him in SOTP without the board instructing anyone to do so. Mr. Griman's been paroled. Uh, so he was able to obtain... Uh, that treatment through the normal process. Well, it wasn't quite a normal process. He had to file a lawsuit in district court and get a get uh, some kind of nasty feedback from a federal judge, and then they gave it to him. And, well, and that, this the is judge a facial never challenge. orders to do anything. He just said his claim may proceed. And I think that the board maintained its normal uh, processes for going forward. Getting back to, to your question, uh, Justice Christensen, uh, the timing of, of programming and what's made available and where inmates are housed are questions that are posed to the Department of Corrections. This is a judicial review involving the actions of the Board of Parole, so we're talking about a party or some, an entity that's not a party to this action. So there's nothing this court can order in this case that's going to change what the Department of Corrections does. I believe that this case or this court's precedent provides that if there is a liberty interest to be implicated, uh, relating to the timing and the provision of, of, uh, of programming, that that's better, in fact, not better, must be brought pursuant to a uh, Chapter 822 PCR uh, in which you allege that. Wouldn't it rights. behoove the, Depart uh, the Board of Parole, though, if they are obligated to provide those services to, for the defendant to reasonably achieve maturity and or rehabilitation? If they know this Catch-22 continues to slap them in the face, how can they reasonably do that? Well, my, my, you know, I hate to answer a question with a question, but how can the board order the Department of Corrections to do anything? It could ask, and it has asked, that programming be provided, but it can't compel the DOC to do anything. And so to that end, uh, the department makes recommendations, and DOC, in accordance with its security policies, will move these people to various institutions when they're ready to step down. In this particular case, Mr. Bonilla is and has been transferred to Newton, where could, he is on a waiting list to take SOTP. So couldn't it's not couldn't like the Board of Parole being, stop being so rigid about that then? If they, if they understand there's a problem with the Department of Corrections and they can't fix it, then shouldn't they change their criteria for considering whether somebody has been rehabilitated or not? I don't think the board is required to abdicate its statutory duty that it only release those individuals that it feels can be safely released into the community without posing a risk to either themselves or, or the public. Those are the standards that you know that this court addressed in, in the Zarati and, and the Props case and, and other instances that parole is not a standardless review and that if someone uh, can demonstrate, or if, if it is demonstrated that in the board's opinion this person can be safely released, then, then, then they should be released. And that's why we have 11 now that are outside the walls, while we have well, another four that have Mr. been identified Lundquist. for a future work release, and eight more that have commenced uh, minimum uh, release. Yes. Mr. Lundquist, um, you know, I, I think the, the question is, is what is the mechanism that juvenile offenders um, are required to have in this parole process, and I think the state's position is what we're offering now uh, is adequate. Yes. But um, since it is a, a paper review, there isn't an opportunity for the uh, parolee to, to do much. How is that parolee um, going to know whether or not he, he or she is obtaining a meaningful uh, review of, uh, of the file? Um, First of all, uh, as part of the parole process, that individual has, through the Department of Corrections classification process, the opportunity to interact with their counselor in person 
review the information that the board is reviewing, review the recommendations that the Department of Corrections is, is going to make, talk with that counselor, collect information, have an opportunity to put input into the process. And so you hear the phrase file review. Well, there's a lot more that goes into it than just someone opening a file and getting out the, the, the rubber stamp, you know, as we all envision Shawshank where, you know, you know stamp and, and we're off to next year. And that's not what happens. Uh, the board has requested that uh, psychological and psychiatric evaluations be conducted for juvenile offenders every time they come up for review so that you can track changes. Uh, you can monitor their, their uh, behavioral uh, issues uh, and discipline. And if there are reasons why the offender believes that that doesn't fairly reflect what's going on with their life, that they can submit materials to the board either through their counselor or, or in written form. And so a, uh, a case file review doesn't mean that you're not getting meaningful review, it's just being handled in a different way. That the vast majority of persons who are paroled in Iowa never appear before the board, it doesn't mean that the board can't get the information it needs to make that, that fair observation. In this particular case, the primary reasons why Mr. Bonilla is not being paroled is because of his history of discipline that lasted many years well past his development uh, stage and that he hadn't completed these programming uh, that he is now on a wait list to, to, to perform. And so he has made strides in the last two, three years, but given that history, I think it's fair that the board would look at and expect a longer period of incapacitation to prove to it that this gentleman is safe. So you don't what would be gained by um, uh, requiring the board to have a, a live hearing with uh, live testimony by, by um, the, the candidate for parole? And there are our, the board has the discretion to order that now. Obviously they don't, and I, and I understand uh, that wasn't answering your question, and I'm getting there, that uh, just from a resource standpoint, you know, the, the, the board uses the interview process to identify those candidates where we have the most questions that someone who is on the scale of there's no chance based upon their history and whatever, we, we don't need to interview because it's not going to be gainful. And the person who clearly is rehabilitated and should be released, we don't need to bring in. It's those people that are closer to the edge that, that that's a helpful uh, process. And so... Um, Allegation is made that, that appearing in person could help someone uh, better identify themselves. Uh, if they're talking about things that are contradicted by paper, I'm not sure that, that that's necessarily uh, helpful. Sometimes appearing in person uh, may actually hinder a person's ability to get parole, depending on the, you know, the demeanor and attitude they choose to, to, to present. What's the, point, what's the point of having someone appear in person if they're not going to... Um, release him without sexual offender treatment. I mean, that, that seems silly to me that, you know, we all know that he's not provided it. That's one of their requirements. So what's the use of even having a uh, in-person hearing or any hearing without that, treat without that treatment in, in his back pocket? Um, I would have to agree with that. Um, uh, to an extent, that doesn't mean that that review isn't meaningful. I think one of the factors you look at is is, is the treatment and programming that someone has gone through, and that uh, many times treatment and programming of the nature of SOTP and, and the like is is vital uh, to ensuring that someone can be released safely in into the community. It seems you never get a meaningful review until you have that. So why waste everybody's time? Because the law requires it. Well, the law requires that the board uh, review these offenders. They, they do so annually, so you can build this record of, of development. Uh, and that uh, building that history of and, and seeing the person over and over and over again, you can see the trajectory of what their behaviors and other things have done. So even though programming and treatment might, might not be complete, it doesn't mean that that's not helping to build a record that provides a fuller picture, an individualized evaluation of who that offender is, so that when that treatment is completed, we know, okay, he's ready to go based upon all these other things we've been observing as, as the process has, has worked its, its course through. Let me ask a, qu a question here. I've, I've been looking at the list of nine uh, remedies that have been suggested, at least. 
and a number of them you seem to agree with, but maybe maybe I missed it. Um, number four, an opportunity to present evidence of rehabilitation. Um, th this is not an in-person hearing, I, I gather, but but they're asking for an opportunity to to put something in the file, and and then uh, opportunity to review. And then number five, I'm just going through opportunity to review and attempt to rebut evidence, and they want to be able to look at what's in the file and respond in some way. Um, and then I guess number seven, proper consideration of mitigating attributes of youth. You don't contest that either, I don't, I don't think. Um, so is it fair to say that on numbers four, five, and, and seven, we really don't have much of a dispute? As, as stated in the briefing, I believe many, if not most, of these things they're requesting are already subsumed within existing procedures. So to, to that extent, uh, I don't think intervention from this court is, is necessary. You know, we're here to judge on their face whether or not the procedures that exist are unconstitutional and fail to provide that, that meaningful opportunity that everyone has, has talked about. So to the extent that we're already providing them, you know, there, there's no need for, for action from, from this court. You know, ultimately, I think the question comes down to, and I see my time is up. Um, you may sum up. Uh, that uh, what they're asking for, is, is, has been asked earlier, is what is the limiting principle on this? Because any juvenile that comes up for parole, whether they're serving life sentence or not, or for an offender in general, uh, would demand that these things are all necessary to give them an opportunity for parole release. And given the fact that the board is successfully reviewing people, over half the parolees have been identified either for release or have been released. Um, I believe that that meaningful opportunity has been provided under existing procedures, and I would ask that the district court be affirmed. So thank you all. Mr. Lundquist, thank you as well. Ms. Austin, you may present your rebuttal. So the board concedes that juvenile offenders like Bonilla have a heightened liberty interest in this parole process being realistic and meaningful. And it concedes that the uh, circumstances of the offense should not overwhelm the analysis and in answering your question, Justice Christensen, about the severity of the offense. There is a concession and agreement on that point. And so the question is not whether due process applies. The question is what level of due process is required. And the due process inquiry is primarily concerned with the reliability of the outcome. One of the problems with the current Board of Parole proceedings, or the, the essential problem, is that it is not reliable in part because it doesn't give the Board of Parole the tools that it needs to reliably determine who is at risk for future offense and who is not because we recognize this constitutional principle that it is impossible, as this court said in Sweet, for a district court, for example, to look at the underlying offense and then make a determination which is reliable uh, about future dangerousness, but about isn't, ability isn't to be rehabilitated. Isn't your problem here that the uh, prison is not providing the services and maybe you need to start out with a, a PCR or some other action in federal court to make sure these folks get services before you start picking on the parole board? So absolutely as a condition that the state has to provide a realistic and meaningful opportunity for release it needs to be providing access to those rehabilitative programs but you the talk board as fast as i do that's, that's what i wanted to know if you're <clears throat> if you're barking up the wrong tree so when you're answering his question if you would also answer why not the department of corrections sounds to me like that's where your beef is it is not solely where our beef is um so our beef is absolutely with the board in not providing a reliable process in not uh giving these juvenile offenders the opportunity to were, present evidence of their rehabilitation. But if you were uh, a juvenile offender and the board had a policy, which I, I don't think is so far out of whack, that if there's any sexual component to your crime, you need to go through sexual offender treatment, and we're not going to let you out until we see the result of that sexual offender treatment. Even if they gave you all nine things that you wanted or a uh, hundred million things that you wanted, He's not going to get out without that. And I don't think you can say that that um, is not a meaningful opportunity if they have that condition. I mean, that, it, seems like, it seems like you 
you need to get the, is it the chicken or the egg? And I don't know which one came first. So we need, we need both, clearly. But what we know is that the Board of Parole has the ability to request that the DOC put juvenile offenders in programming. And when it makes those requests, the DOC honors those requests. It makes them for some juveniles. It doesn't make them for others. The same is true of this opportunity to be heard. When the board is seriously considering an offender, it gives them the opportunity to be heard. It gives them an in-person interview. They and their counsel are able to present evidence of rehabilitation and maturity. And juvenile offenders without the opportunity to be heard are not given that. Doesn't the current uh, process provide a written opportunity for the juvenile offender to present his or her case? It's true, but as the scholarship recognizes, especially for juveniles, um, the opportunity to present your case in writing is not sufficient, in part because of their reduced capacity to communicate in writing. But he's not a juvenile anymore. He's 33 years old. Right, but in light of the circumstances of growing up in prison, um, this is a, a population that has a reduced capacity to communicate in writing, and certainly um, they need the assistance of counsel to help them be able to assemble the evidence of their rehabilitation and then present it to the Board of Parole. Well, would, the procedures, the, would the procedures that you're requesting apply to all juvenile offenders regardless of length of sentence to the extent you're arguing there's a heightened liberty interest in better parole procedures for juvenile offenders? So the um, constitutional jurisprudence that we are drawing on is this categorical right of juveniles not to serve a life without parole sentence, a sentence that belongs to homicide and non-homicide offenders serving these lengthy terms because they will serve life sentences but for a meaningful and realistic opportunity for release. So the class as we're defining it in this categorical challenge are juvenile uh, homicide offenders and non-homicide right. offenders serving life with parole. I understand what your categorization is, but what principle distinguishes a juvenile offender who's serving a B uh, versus uh, an A? I mean, isn't there still a heightened liberty interest, as you put it, in... Uh, more robust parole procedures for that juvenile offender? The highest liberty interest for juvenile offenders would be liberty, um, juvenile offenders who are serving life with parole sentences because that requires that parole process to be realistic and meaningful or else they will serve a life sentence. That is different categorically than juveniles who are serving lengthy sentences that have an opportunity for release through the expiration of that sentence. It is a liberty interest of a different magnitude, certainly. But I do think that under Article 1, Section 17, uh, much of this court's analysis of the individual features of youth apply to, when you look at the Lyle case, um, all juveniles. Uh, but that does not translate to this um, heightened uh, requirement during the parole process that they have, for example, this individualized assessment. Because but for the parole process, these juvenile offenders that we're talking about won't have that. And that's something that the Constitution requires that they have. And it I, looks like I am um, over my time. You may sum up. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, because Mr. Bonilla is being deprived of a realistic and meaningful opportunity for release, and the board concedes that there is a heightened liberty interest that he has in that, we ask that this court determine what minimal protections are due to ensure that and remand the Board of Parole to, uh, with instructions to provide any of those nine that we seek that the court determines are necessary to ensure his due process. Thank you. Ms. Dawson, thank you as well. Mr. Lundquist, thank you again. The case of Bonilla versus Board of Parole is now then submitted. Anyone want a break? You want a break? All right, we're, we're going to, we'll take uh, five minutes, uh, so, uh, but we'll sit in recess. You don't need to stand. We'll take five minutes uh, and return then to hear uh, Baldwin. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.